Regular viewers of Tales from the IE know that the first U.S. concert by the Rolling Stones happened in San Bernardino, California, on June 5, 1964. It took place at the Swing Auditorium on the National Orange Show Fairgrounds. The group's second concert in San Bernardino happened less than five months later on Halloween night, 1964. Once again, it took place at the Swing Auditorium. Like the June concert, it was presented by Inland Empire radio station KMEN. Cayman wasted no time in promoting the appearance in their weekly music survey. Six days before the show, Swing Auditorium promoter Bob Lewis said in the San Bernardino Sun-Telegram newspaper that 1,000 tickets were still available. Lewis predicted that the concert would be an advanced ticket sale sellout. Three days before the show, this photo appeared in the Daily Sun newspaper. The photo caption stated that fast-going tickets were still available for purchase. On the day of the concert, a Daily Sun article reported that tickets could still be purchased until 5 p.m. at the Harris Department Stores in San Bernardino and Riverside, and at Lear's Music Store, also in San Bernardino. Beginning at 7 p.m., they would be available at the Orange Show box office. That same day, this photo and article appeared in the Daily Sun. It announced that the newspaper's teen correspondent, John Morthland, would be interviewing the Rolling Stones backstage on the night of the concert. Before the show, Stones fans lined up hours early to get the best vantage points since all seats were unreserved. A number of candid snapshots were taken by Stones fans who managed to get backstage. Radio station KMEN allowed some fans in. Others gained access by using other connections, like Swing Auditorium promoters and security guards. Keith Richards and Mick Jagger seemed to be the most popular subjects for the young photographers. But by far, Jagger was undeniably the favorite Rolling Stone to photograph before the show. Someone sprang for color film and also took backstage photographs. In the photo on the right, a student reporter can be seen interviewing the Rolling Stones. It turns out that the young reporter was John Morthlin, a San Bernardino High School journalism student. In this photo, he's seen on the left. This photo appeared in the Daily Sun. Morthlin was the editor-in-chief of San Bernardino High School's Tyra Weekly student newspaper. He was also a correspondent for the Daily Sun. Along with the photo was his article. The first Rolling Stone he spoke to was Keith Richards. I like America very much, he said in a thick British accent. Our reception here has been wonderful. Last week in New York, we almost got torn apart. There were thousands of kids there, and after the show, the police just couldn't hold them back. They told us just to run for it, and we almost didn't make it. We also had a very enthusiastic group waiting for us at the airport. Bill Wyman added, In the United States, we usually get our best reception here and in New York. Our fans are very good to us in America. Mick Jagger, the clown of the group, explained what he thought was the big difference between the Stones' American fans and those in Europe. It's the girls, he said. They have longer hair and they dress differently. As he was speaking, an Orange Show policeman walked by. With an impish grin on his face, Mick reached to his belt for an imaginary gun. The cop laughed and went for his gun. Mick threw up his hands in mock terror and laughed back. What makes the Rolling Stones so popular wherever they go? I really can't say why, offered a tired Charlie Watts. I can't define the appeal, but I'm not going to fight it. And what happens when the group gets older and is forced to disband? I can't speak for the rest, but for me, there's going to be a 10-year holiday, sighed a frenzied Brian Jones. A Morthlin article also ran in the November 6, 1964, San Bernardino High School Tyra Weekly student newspaper. In part, the review read, How do San Bernardino teenagers react to the Rolling Stones? The answer in a word is, fanatically. 
I had the opportunity to interview the Stones for close to two hours Saturday night. I found them to be rather unusual, to say the least. But the funniest thing that night was the way the girls roared their approval at the Swing Auditorium. By the time the Stones had finished their first number, Not Fade Away, every person in Swing Auditorium was standing on his seat. Girls were already screaming like there would be no tomorrow, and the stage was already covered with jelly beans. Apparently, the first song just about took it out of vocalist Mick Jagger because he walked back to the area of drummer Charlie Watts and took off his coat. As he pranced to the front of the stage, the crowd went crazy. I guess the thought of a striptease intrigued them. As he moved from one end of the stage to the other, harassed policemen moved with him. When Mick moved to the left, the cops dashed over to the left side, trying to hold back the crowd. When he came toward the right, the girls on the right side of the auditorium screamed and tried to break through the police, who by now were on that side of the auditorium. The poor cops. I think they got more of a workout than the Stones and the fans combined. Fifty-five years after the concert, Inland Empire journalist David Allen reported on what became of John Morthland. Morthland became a staff writer for the Sun newspaper in 1966. By 1969, he was a writer for Rolling Stone, the counterculture music magazine. He later became an associate editor for the publication. Perhaps his highest profile reporting for the magazine was in 1969, when he again crossed paths with the Rolling Stones. Mortland was among a team of writers that covered the violence that marred the Altamont Festival where the Stones were headliners. In 1974, Mortland left Rolling Stone for another music magazine, Cream. He eventually became an editor of the publication. After he left Cream, he became a freelance writer contributing to numerous music publications. In 1985, he authored a book, The Best of Country Music. Around the same time, he moved his base of operations to Austin, Texas, and its thriving music scene. In the mid-80s, Mortland became a writer-at-large for Texas Monthly, where he continued writing until his passing in March 2016 at the age of 68. After Mortland died, Rolling Stone magazine made note of his various contributions to the publication, such as his coverage of the Altamont Festival, the Kent State shootings, and Jimi Hendrix's funeral. John Morthland wasn't the only Inland Empire High School journalist that interviewed the Stones backstage in 1964. Joe Striggle and Mike Peters of Eisenhower High School in Rialto also were there. Their impressions of the band went as follows. Brian Jones seemed to be more interested in his appearance than the other ones. Smoking a cigar, he gave us the impression of being high class. His hair looked the best of the group. When asked to whom he owed his success, he implied that he had the rest of the group to thank for it. We like the honest answer of Keith Richards, who said he thought his music could be better. Keith looked the most different in person because his hair is jet black. In most of his pictures, his hair is brownish. We consider him best looking. Mick Jagger had the look of responsibility and didn't seem to want to be bugged. He said that they were soon to make a movie in England. Charles Watts seemed to move mechanically and showed no expression. He answered most questions with, I don't know. We consider him most humble and felt sorry for him because he looked so lonely. Our favorite of the group was Bill Wyman. He had an air of friendliness and gave us special cooperation and attention. He had the best sense of humor. When asked what he thought of British teens compared to American teens, he said, well, they're the same age. According to various online set lists, these are the 10 songs performed by the Stones at the swing. Nine of them were cover songs and one was an original. The covers were originally recorded by Buddy Holly, Irma Thomas, Bo Diddley, Bobby Womack, Wilson Pickett, Slim Harpo, 
Walter Brown and J. McShann, and two by Chuck Berry. The original was Tell Me, composed by Jagger and Richards. In this Daily Sun photo, it can be seen that the mostly female audience was enraptured by the Rolling Stones' performance, with the possible exception of the young man in the center of the picture, who looked visibly stunned by the experience. In a November 3, 1964 Sun article, San Bernardino County Sheriff's Lieutenant Eugene L. Majors was interviewed. He led a team of 30 officers providing security at the Stones concert. In part, the article read, The officers raised the stage, set out a 20-foot no-man's land in front, placed the front row well out of reach of the stand, and warned they would stop the show if trouble began. Well briefed on the sheriff's tactics, the Rolling Stones apparently gave one of their best performances under a satisfying shield of the law. We were concerned about getting the musicians away from the Oring Show grounds, Majors added, but we solved that problem with a little subterfuge. When the last loud note sounded, the quintet dashed from the stage and disappeared out a rear entrance as the youngsters pressed the pursuit. Well, we got them into a private car and on their way before the teenagers knew what happened, Majors added. Most of the enthusiastic audience had crowded around the bus in which the five performers arrived, but the private car technique for the departure apparently spoiled the deluge. The last word on the Halloween concert occurred in the November 12, 1964 editorial page of the Daily Sun. Penny Sieber of Redlands wrote, Editor of the Sun-Telegram, Thank you so much for the two wonderful articles on the Rolling Stones. They were really fab, and it was great of you not to chop them, as many magazines and other newspapers have. The whole thing was the gear. The Rolling Stones would return to play the Swing Auditorium two more times, in May of 1965 and July of 1966, for a total of four appearances at the Hall. The group wanted to return for a fifth visit during their fall 1981 U.S. tour. However, their representatives were told that the swing was not available, having fallen victim to a private plane crash in September 1981. 